Hey guys, Sam here. Uh, welcome back to another reloading video. Now this one's going to cover my workflow. In other words, it's going to be a demonstration of what I do to work from a fire case all the way to a loaded uh, round to shoot. Now one of the things that I don't mention very often and I ought to is uh, context. So when you see me doing this video, you're going you're gonna to see me working with several different uh, cartridges because it's taken that long to make the video, but you know, this is revolving around precision rifles, so this is for mostly for Jake's competition rifle. So it's, uh, you know, my standards for that particular rifle is going to be 10 shots under 20 feet per second ES for muzzle velocity and a half inch accuracy. So, uh, you know, it, we're not shooting bench rest here and we're not shooting plinking ammo for a gas gun. It's somewhere in between. So... This is a process that we followed all last year, 100%, nothing varied, you know, maybe a couple little things with tooling, but for the most part, the process is exactly the same. And we fired close to 14,000 rounds next year. I see this year probably going to be close to that, maybe even a little bit more. Even with the coronavirus thing going on right now, uh, we're still shooting. So uh, anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through the whole process. So the first thing I'm going to do when I get home after shooting is I'm going to uh, put my round count in my logbook. So right here I have uh, several columns here. I put the date, number of rounds fired, and what my uh, total round count for that barrel is. Next thing that's going to happen is those rounds, those uh, pieces of brass are going to go into one of these bins that's marked how many times it's fired and what it is. This, this one here is a 9 times fired 6547 brass. Now when I'm ready to start working on it, it's going to go into these bins like this. So I'm going to put a sticky note in there saying what it is. So this is 6 by 47 8 times fired brass. And uh, once it lands in this bin, it's off to the races. So let's just get this video started. Okay, now that I have all my cases documented, my barrel log filled out, uh, deprime the cases, the cases go into these bins with a little sticky note telling me what's in them. Uh, they come out to the shop. Now the next step is going to be getting them all cleaned up. You know, I'll use something like this brass boss or a drill with a case brush, you know, neck brush in it, things like that. And then they go into the tumbler. Uh, once they get clean, I'm going to take them all. I'm going to either anneal them on my annealer or I'm going to lube them up and size them, uh, depending on what I want to do. Uh, right now what I'm going to do is I have a 300 and some pieces of 6547 sitting here that's going to go through the annealer. Another 100 pieces of uh, 6547 that needs to be prepped clean, put it in the tumbler, then go through the kneeler, and then a, what, 300 pieces of 223 that I'm just going to drop into the tumbler in size. So, you know, I'm not going to do every single step every single time on all of my cases. I'm going to, you know, pick and choose what I want to do for whatever cartridge I'm working with, whatever, you know, number of times fired brass I'm working with. But anyway, they come out here, I go through this whole process out here, They'll go back into my reloading room, I'll size them, and then they'll come back out here to get trimmed. You know, when things are really busy, I'll leave the, the bin that the brass that's in the tumbler is in, right here in, inside my uh, separator in the bucket. Uh, usually it isn't that bad, but you know, that's a good place to store it until it's done. Okay, so now I have about 400 pieces of 8 times fired 6547 that's annealed and ready to go and be sized. Uh, what I do is on my sticky notes, I just put the, you know, whatever I'm working on at the time on the sticky note so that I know where I'm at in the process. Now, a lot of that's overkill because, you know, I can, if I work on all this the same day, I obviously know exactly where I'm at. But sometimes this stuff will sit for a week or two, and these are just reminders for me. Or if I want to tell Jake, hey, go grab that bin of, 
eight times fired, six, five, 47 that we already annealed, he can look at the note and say, oh, this must be the one. Uh, and then this 223, I'm not gonna anneal it. This is just for my trainer rifle. So I'm just gonna size that. But anyway, next step is to uh, loop them up and run through the sizing die. <laughs> you know, this video has been taking so long to make that, you know, now we're all the way into a, you know, Jake has a different rifle. <laughs> Check that sucker out. Uh, different chambering, and I was running a 6 Creed, and we're uh, sizing that brass today. So this was kind of the missing link uh, that I was missing in the other video, and now we're going to tie that all together. So uh, right now I'm making a video about full length sizing and how, to, how I go about doing it. So what I'm going to do now in the workflow video is I'm going to show you that, hey, we just pulled out all this brass from the, this is 6 Creed, this is on its second firing, it's been fired two times, so we're not doing any annealing on it or whatever, but we did just pull this out of the tumbler, I've lubed this with one shot, and now I'm going to size it all. Uh, and that'll be the, the part of the process right before trimming it. So anyway, that's where we're at, we're in the sizing part of it. I think that's funny, you know, here we have a, a lot of things have changed since I started this video. You know, just about all the matches have been canceled all the way into May at least. You know, this is April 1st. Uh, we're right in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic going on right now in the world. So anyway, I thought, well, I'll finish up that video while I'm making Jake some practice ammo. Alright, so anyway, that's the sizing process, and then we're going to move on to the trimming process. Okay, so when we get done sizing the cases, they get dropped back into the vibratory tumbler with corn cob media to get rid of any uh, case lube that's left on the case, and then they come out to the shop to get trimmed. Uh, we've been using this Henderson Precision uh, powered case trimmer for a little over a year, or a little less than a year now, I guess. Uh, we've trimmed thousands of cases on this, multiple calibers, multiple cases thing is awesome. This used to be one of our least favorite parts of the whole process. You know, we've tried a lot of different methods over the years of trimming cases, and this was our first go at using a trimmer that, uh, that cuts the length, the inside and the outside chamfers at the same time. And it's very fast, very efficient. Now, you know, this part of the process is actually one of the easiest ones. So anyway, we're going to trim the cases and then we'll take them back into the reloading room. We'll clean the necks out to make sure there's no case lube on the inside of the necks. And then we'll prime them, powder them, put bullets in them. All right, so after we prime the cases, before we put them into the loading blocks, you know, as I'm priming them, I'm putting the uh, case mouth down into this uh, block. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the ends of the cases so that we can identify which ones are jakes that matches. So all we do is just take a Sharpie, and in his case, he uses all orange cases. So everything that's marked orange, we know came out of Jake's rifle. I use a green one. Real simple, easy way to mark the cases. Now they make all kinds of fancy tools to do this, but uh, this works. <laughs> and you can go buy this wherever you want. Anyway, that's how we do it. We just mark the cases, and the reason we do that is so that we can identify the case at a match. You know, so when it comes off of a stage, you can look at it and say, "Oh, those orange ones there are mine." Pretty simple. Okay, so now that I've got everything cleaned and sized and trimmed, uh, the last step in that process is going to be priming the cases. I do that with my bench primer here, this RCBS unit, and then I start loading them in the loading blocks like that. And what I have are 50 round loading blocks from Sinclair 
that I can put these cases in and stage them. And then what I do is I just use post-it notes to tell me what's in the blocks. Uh, usually I remember it, but you know it's good insurance. I always stick it right here when I'm getting ready to throw powder so I know exactly what I'm doing, what case I'm working with. And then if I'm using a load that we use a lot of, which is this one right now, I have a big sticky note right here that tells me the charge, the charge weight, the powder, and the bullet seating depth. So it's real easy. It's just you know flat out cruise control. Once those cases are in those loading blocks, you know, you just come in here and you look at those and you go, yeah, all you have to do is throw powder and I'm off to the races. So, you know, that's an important consideration for volume right now because Jake has fired 714 rounds to a 6GT in three weeks. So a little over 700 rounds in three weeks. And it's not, you know, he's in school full time right now. He's 15 years old. So uh, this being the, what, middle of February, he had yesterday off for President's Day but he didn't even shoot on that day. So, you know, these are three day shoots, three days usually during the week when he can shoot. And he's going through 700 rounds in three weeks. So when summer comes along and he's not in school, that round count's just gonna go up. You know, it'll be more like 1,200 to 1,500 rounds in a month. So, you know, it's important to be able to come in here and just look at this, these loading blocks, look at that, turn these on and go to town. Now, you probably notice I have three Charge Master lights here. When we started out, we were only running one. We added another one last summer, so we we're running two. And then he got the third one for Christmas this year, so we've been running three for about two months now. Uh, fabulous. <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome time saver. But anyway, I just line them up like this. I take a 50 round block, hit go, charge them, throw powder into the block. And then once I get 50 of these full of powder, I'm going to move over to the press and I'm going to start seeding bullets. All right, so this block of 50 is loaded now, so now I'm going to move over next to the press, start seeding bullets. And as after I put that there, I'm just going to pull this next block over, put the funnel in it, and I'll just start the, the scales back up again. So as I'm standing over there seeding bullets, when I hear the, the buzzers go off on the charge masters, I'll just stop, come over, pour the three charges, move the funnel over, but they'll all start running on their own again and I'll go back over and seat bullets. So uh, I don't seat you know, one bullet every time it throws a powder charge. I go in 50 round blocks. It's just easier for me to do that. Now Jake, he likes to mess around and do all kinds of goofy stuff and you know, stick bullets in the top of them and all that, but I found it easier just to throw the block over there, put bullets in it while all these are charging. Now one other thing I'll say about powder is when I'm running the three charge masters like that, I'm only running one kind of powder in them. So I don't try to, you know, do two charge masters running Varget, one running H4350 or anything like that. If I have all three of them running, one kind of powder. And normally the jug would sit right here next to them so I see what I'm working with. Now today, I'm playing around with some Reloader 16 and Alliant thought it would be a cool idea to put eight pounds of powder in a 16 pound container so it doesn't fit very well there so I just put it on the floor right at my feet so I know what I have in the powder dispensers. All right one last thing I'm going to do before I start throwing bullets in that is I'm going to look down in every one of them and make sure that there's powder in them. Uh, cheap easy insurance. And as I move those over there I'm just going to pull this block forward fire them up again. Now when I start seeding bullets usually uh, with my seeding die, even if I know that the last bullet I put in there was the same one I'm working with today in the same depth, I always back them off 10, 20 thousandths just to make sure I don't uh, go too deep on the first one. Uh, since I know I've been seeding these bullets for the last 20 minutes, I know I don't have to do anything at all. But again, the note that I left over there shows my seeding depth for the RDFs that we're working with today. So all I have to do is duplicate that load real easy. So I'll load these 50 up. And then I'll start putting them in these boxes and put them away. Now inside the box, you know, I have different uh, loads. This one is the one we're working with. That's another one that we're working with. So I know I can just put them in there. I already have notes. Uh, you know, I used to, I used to get pretty anal about putting different dates in the boxes and all that. But you know, we literally loaded this ammo and shot it on Monday and this is uh, Tuesday afternoon so 
you know, not much has changed obviously, but last night we went through the whole cycle again, cleaning brass, sizing brass, documenting everything in the barrel log, and here we are again throwing powder. So uh, I'm at a rare crossroads right now where I have some brass that's three times fired, some that's four times fired, and I have to mix them up just because we need, you know, enough ammo to practice and get our zeros on Friday, and then Jake is shooting an RTC match Saturday and Sunday. So we basically have to load up everything we have now and he'll cycle through both of them. So that's another thing that I didn't point out. Uh, one of the things I like to do, and I'm not going to pull one of those cases full of powder, I'll pull one of these empty ones. We mark the bottom of our cases and we usually put uh, just a, a line of Sharpie. You know, they sell all kinds of fancy things to mark your cases. We just stand them upside down or actually, you know, head side up after we're done priming and then just, you know, run a line across it with a Sharpie. Now Jake uses orange, I use green. Uh, some of the cases I use black. So what we did on this one was, I know all my three times fired brass for Jake's gun, I'm gonna put one line on, because that's how they're already marked. The four times fired brass, I put two lines on there. So when we get off this match, what I'll do is I'll make sure that we fire all of our four times fires so that it's all done. And then what we'll do is we'll cycle through the three times fired again in practice so that it'll get caught up to the four times fired. But anyway, that's how we do it. A lot of questions about if, whether or not I still like this mech marksman. Love it. Thing is awesome. I wish I had a one on every bench now. I usually seat three to five bullets in the amount of time it takes for those three to fire up. That's pretty much all there is to it. Now one other thing that's uh, kind of pertinent to what I'm doing right now is the seating. Uh, what I do with any new bullet, new load, new case, new anything I'm working with is a, I document how consistent is the seating depth. In other words, if I'm using this uh, Redding competition seating die with the stem that came in it and everything, and I want to run 115 RDF, so with 2000s neck tension on Horner D6 GT brass with 34.5 grains of reloader 16. Can I seat to the exact depth with every single throw, no matter what? In other words, if, if I want to go 1.865 on the seating depth on that, will it load a whole block at 1.865 without fiddling with it, without having to change this at all? you know, for one or two here, or if not exact, how close is it? So is it plus or minus a thou, plus or minus two thousandths? And it starts to give me a, a pretty good idea on, uh, you know, how well, number one, how well does that bullet sit inside the stem that's in the seating die? Uh, is my neck tension too much? You know, do I need to back off my neck tension a little bit? Is my powder charge compressed? You know, things like that. And what that allows me to do is not worry about having my caliper sitting here with my comparator and checking every single one of them. Now during load development, I do check every single one of them. That's how I come up with that documentation. So in the notes in my book, I write, you know, 100% at whatever the seating depth was. So when I come back through, I can measure the first one because I always back that off. I can set that die exactly where I want it. And then once I get there, measure like one or two or three or five even, and then put it down, don't even think about it. Load up the whole block. Uh, works pretty well. A lot of that has to do with how consistent you know, the nose profile is, how consistent the neck tension is, how, how well that nose fits inside the stem, but you know, it's not rocket science. You just document it and see what you can do with whatever you're working with and then go to town. Uh, but having a bullet and a seating stem and a neck tension that works so that you don't even have to worry about it, it's awesome for high volume stuff like this.
Okay, so we're working with 115 grain Nosler RDFs in Jake 6 GT, uh, specifically to, so that it can match up ballistically with Jake or uh, with Nick for the RTC team matches. So, uh, what I like to do with any bullet I'm using, instead of trying to pull them out of the box and all that stuff, I just grab a handful and put them in this tray right next to the press. Makes it real easy to grab. Like I was saying before, Jake likes to you know, stick a bullet in each one of them like that and then pick the whole thing up and put it in there. I don't like that at all. So I just grab each one, stroke it the same way so it goes to the stop, pull it out. Okay, so when I'm done loading, I just put them in ammo boxes or put them in these ammo sleeves for shooting matches. Uh, up in the lid of the box, I have what the load is right here. Uh, this is pretty much all my note taking at this point. If I have a load developed and it's shooting well in the rifle, I don't worry about writing in my main load book anymore. In other words, every time I load ammo, I don't go right in there. Loaded 276 rounds of GT. It doesn't make any sense. It's too repetitive for me. So I just run with what's on the lid of the box. Unless I have to change something, and then I'll change it here, and I'll make a note in my book that I changed something. But uh, that's it for note-taking right now. Now these sleeves are pretty cool. I don't think I've ever showed you guys these. These are AM Precision. Uh, they're designed to shoot matches. They hold 40 in a sleeve, and we typically carry three of them with us. So, you know, we can take up to 120 rounds in this little soft case. Uh, it takes up a lot less room in the pack than a thick ammo box and fits in a lot more places so these work out pretty well but anyway that's it that's the whole workflow now it's time to go shoot them and start the process all over again Yeah. Uh -huh. 